Thanks for watching a message today. My name is Caleb Combs. I'm the gathering pastor here at the river, and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is text River Connect, no space, to 97000. Or you can visit our website for more information. If you'd like to support the River Church financially, you can text an amount to 84321 or again visit our website, theriverchurch.cc, and click the Giving tab. We hope you enjoy and are challenged by the message today. Um, hopefully uh, you have gotten a chance to know me. If not, please take, uh, take a second tonight and just introduce yourself. I'm trying to learn names. Really bad at it. Uh, but I would love to get a chance to meet you. Uh, my name's Justin. Uh, I am the recovery director here. Uh, and I've just recently started. Uh, for those of you who are just now coming back, maybe after a long stint, you may look and say, that guy looks a little bit like Roger, just younger. Uh, <laughs> trust me, uh, I, I get that. But um, for those of you guys who, who don't know me, I, like, like I said, I'm from Florida. You may have heard that in past sermons. Um, but one thing that I'm kind of known for is when, whenever there's like a problem, like something that's going on, I seem to get frustrated like really quick. And uh, my wife is really accustomed to this because especially when it comes to technology, like I'm someone who I would consider myself pretty good with technology, but it's like to the point where I end up finding more problems than I do actually solving problems, right? So like my wife will come up to me and she will have her work computer, which is like ancient, and she'll look at me and be like, Justin, I can't get this file to save right. And I'll be like, okay, let me take a look at it. And then 30 minutes later, she'll come back and I have it like apart in pieces. And I'm like, this is like, what is happening? It's dirty in here. And then she's like, how did you even get to this point? I'm like, well, you know, I found it wasn't saving because of this minor thing. And then I went deeper into your settings and Trust me, you got some whacked out settings. And then I found out that there was a problem with your storage device. And then blah, and blah, and blah. And I could continue to bore you. But eventually I get so hyper-focused on something that I don't understand. And I get so frustrated that I am so determined to solve the problem that I'm not willing to, to ask for help. And especially in a, in a generation where we have like umpteen million resources at our fingertips. Like I could just Google the problem and have found it in 15 minutes. Uh, I chose not to because I wanted to know that I could solve it. I wanted to know that I could, you know, figure it out. And, and it's even worse because my dad, he, uh, before he became a pastor, he built computers for a living. So I know if I had a problem, like I could literally, all I had to do is pick up the phone and call him and he could solve it like that, Right? But I'm not willing to because my frustration, my, my focus on what's going on doesn't, and, and probably a little bit of pride too, doesn't let me do that, right? I'm, 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 I'm so focused on what I don't understand, what doesn't make sense to me, that I completely miss an easy way to find the solution that I'm looking for. And so tonight, we're going to be jumping into the book of Acts, an amazing story about uh, a man named Philip and how he follows the leading of the Holy Spirit and is led to an amazing encounter with a random stranger. But before we jump in, I want to take a second and pray because uh, prayer is something that is so incredibly unique because it is both something that allows us to go before the amazing creator of the universe, but also go before the person who loves us and cares for us. So let's take a second and pray. Lord, tonight as we dive into your word, I pray that you give us understanding. That as we go to your word and we seek the solutions to the problems in our lives, that we would find them. Lord, I pray that you, your Holy Spirit would help us to understand that it would soften our hearts, that we wouldn't have pride tonight in this room, but the humility to recognize the things that we need to shape and change about our own personal walks with you. We love you so much. In your precious name, Jesus' name, amen. So, I'm going to be starting in Acts chapter 6. And there's this guy by the name of Philip. 
And, and we're introduced to Philip uh, just a couple chapters earlier. In, in Acts chapter 6, he, he's talked about, um, he, he's, he, he's discussed when they're talking about the church of Jerusalem. And he's mentioned, along with several other guys, as a, a man who is wise, who is full of God, who is passionate about Christ, who, who, whose life reflects the values and characteristics of a Christian that, um, that is all in. Right, and so he is—he's mentioned with these other guys as someone who is going to be a, a attendant to the body of the church in Jerusalem. So there was a bunch of different problems that were going on, and so he was this wise and godly man who was there to try and help them figure out and deal with and give solutions to the problems that they were dealing with. And so we find in Acts chapter eight. It says this, we're going to be in verse 26, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to a road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. And there is an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship 28 or worship uh, and was returning seated in his chariot and he was reading from the book of Isaiah from the prophet Isaiah and the spirit said to Philip go and join this chariot and so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked him do you understand what you're reading and he said how can I unless someone guides me And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him, and the passage of scripture that he was reading said this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him about the good news of Jesus. So there's this guy, Philip. And Philip is is described by the Bible as this wise man. Like, he knows what's going on. He's experienced with dealing with problems. And the thing about it is, Philip was stationed or at the church living in Jerusalem. One of the, the, the pinnacles, the holy city of the Jewish religion. And so they had studied and studied and studied and studied the Old Testament. And he, as someone who was a believer there, had taken all that knowledge, all that information about all these Old Testament prophets and laws and and everything that he had learned in the Old Testament scriptures, and he had been applying all the truths of Christ to them. And so he knew what he was talking about, right? He had experience. He had heard this passage referenced and referenced and referenced, right? And to the Jewish community, it meant one thing, but this guy, this Ethiopian, had no experience either side. He didn't know about the background of the the Jewish context and culture. He didn't know who Isaiah was. He was coming back. He probably had picked up this holy scripture while he was in Jerusalem. And on his way back, he decided, hey, I'll stop and read and try and figure this out. And so he decides... That he's going to figure out what this means. And he sits. And he, he sits by himself and reads and reads and reads. And I can imagine him going over and over and over the same section. Trying to figure out what it meant. But then there's this guy named Philip. And, and, and Philip was led by God to this spot. Right? It said the angel of the Lord that God told him to go along this road. Now, I can't imagine that Philip was thinking in his head, oh man, I bet I'm going to meet some guy 
and he's going to be reading through a perfect passage of scripture for me to share what Christ can do. But he followed, because God told him he followed, he obeyed. And he was led to this Ethiopian. And so instead of waiting and sitting there and just kind of be like, hey, you know, I'm from Jerusalem, right? Like instead of trying to, to get this guy to finally, you know, ask for his help, he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? Like that's, that's kind of an ambiguous text, right? Do you get it? Do you understand it? God sent me here. Yeah, this, I'd imagine this is what he was thinking. God sent me here, and I'd imagine that this is what for. And so he says, hey, are you struggling with that? Do you need some help? And the Ethiopian, I would imagine, frustrated at this point, like me, tearing apart my wife's computer, is like, how am I going to get it unless someone explains it to me? Like, right? And, and so he reads him this passage and he, he poses him the question, about whom does the prophet say this? Himself or someone else? Right? He's like, is he talking about himself? Is it like, when he says a lamb to a slaughter, like, is he talking about an actual lamb? Who is he talking about? And so here is where Philip has the opportunity to start. Right? He has, he has this perfect opportunity to share with him the good news of the gospel. And so tonight, I'm going to take a second and explain the good news of the gospel. And I would implore you, please listen and hear this. Right? Because this is the most important story ever. This is the mo most important truth of all time. And so he starts by saying... This sheep is a guy named Jesus. And in his, his context, he's like, boom, mic drop. It's a guy named Jesus. But to the Ethiopian, he's like, uh, okay. It'd be like me saying, it, yeah, it's a guy named Dave. You'd be like, okay, who's Dave? And so then what Philip has the pleasure of doing is explaining to him who Jesus is. And so he says, there's, it's this guy named Jesus. So the natural next question is, why did Jesus have to die? Like, why is, when he says, like, a, a sheep that's led to the slaughter, why did this guy have to die? Like, did he do something wrong? I don't think he does something wrong, because later on it says, in, is, in his humiliation, verse 33, justice was denied him. So why is this guy dying? Like, what, is he, what did he do, or, or how did this most extreme punishment befall him? And so what Philip does is he goes, well, that's going to take a little bit of explanation. He says, you know, way back, we, me being a Jew, we as the nation of Israel, we would have to atone for the things that we did wrong. We would have to make a sacrifice for something we did wrong. And so what we do is we would take a sheep that was as pure as we could find. And we would say, this represents my sin. And then they would kill it. Right? And he goes, and I'd imagine some of you in this room are looking and saying, what? And the same thing. The eunuch's like, why are you guys killing sheep? Like, that doesn't really make sense. What are you saying? Why do you have to just randomly kill a sheep? That doesn't make any sense. And so he says, because there's this thing in the world called sin, right? When we do things wrong, when we do the opposite of what God the creator has made and told us to do, we sin. Anytime we lie, anytime we steal, anytime we we do anything that we know is wrong. Anytime we speed, right? Anytime we do the littlest or the biggest sin, there is a punishment that comes from it. And then, you know what he does? He says, I'm going to, I mean, they didn't have the New Testament in this time, right? They had heard stories about Jesus, but they didn't have a physical copy of the New Testament like we did. So what he does is he goes, why don't you flip a couple pages back 
in that book that you're reading, right? Why don't you, I'll use the Jewish book to explain my truth that is Christianity. And so he says, go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel verse 18. And this is God speaking through Ezekiel. It says, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The so- but the soul who sins shall die. So he's saying is, we all belong to this creator God. And when we do something, when we, we sin, when we do wrong and do that against God, we are now souls of death. We now deserve death. And so, before I knew this guy named Jesus, before this guy named Jesus came, I would have to push that sin out of my soul and onto this animal and have it killed, right? Right? And so there was a physical representation of basically what was happening in my heart. But I was still bound to it, right? Because I still had to go, anytime I sinned, anytime I messed up, I'd have to go and find another sheep. I'd have to go and find another sheep. And do it, and do it, and do it, and do it. And what he's saying is, this sin is so severe, this death is so severe, what it does is, it separates us from God. It's not this immediate striking down. It's not this immediate, like, oh, I sin, and then I'm killed on the spot. No, it is a separation from God. It is me not being in the promises of God, a death spiritually, which leads to a death eternally. And that is hell. You know, when we think of hell, we think of this place that's just like fire. It's really hot, right? But what hell actually is, is It's a separation, an eternal separation from God. And we know all good things come from God. So which means you are separated from any good thing. You know what that means? It's not just physical pain. It's emotional pain. Emotional torment. It's it's mental pain. Mental torment. Spiritual pain. Spiritual torment. That's what hell is. And so he's explaining this to this Ethiopian and being like, there was this ultimate need to deal with that separation, not only because we don't want to die here, but we don't want to be dead for all eternity. We don't want to have that separation from God for eternity. And you know why that is? It's because God created us to be in a relationship with him. He goes, he, he starts at Jesus and goes all the way back to creation. Because we were created to be in a relationship with Christ. Right? We were created to be praying. To be walking in the garden beside him. To, be, to not have to deal with pain. To not have to deal with suffering. To be worshiping and loving our creator without any separation or any barrier. Right? That is who we are meant to be. But we messed it up. And then he continues. He goes back and he says, and that's because of sin. And sin causes this. And then sin requires this payment. And he goes, you know what? Jesus is that payment. He's better than any sheep you could ever find. Why? Because he is so pure, so perfect, and so holy. Right? You're saying, and this is littered throughout the Old Testament. This, this discussion or, or this, these prophecies about this, this man who will come and will be God and he will live among us and he will endure and, and suffer and then he will be slaughtered. And he goes, so it goes right back to that passage in Isaiah. He will be slaughtered. He will be denied justice. His life will be taken away. Right? His life will be taken away. And the the crazy thing is, it doesn't stop there. And Philip doesn't stop there. He says, but you know what? The reason why Jesus, the perfect man, the man who lived without sin, who incurred no debt, who doesn't have to deal with death, but dealt with it for our sake, he raised to life. He raised to life. He beat the system. 
He solved the problem. He dealt with the separation so that you don't have to. And you know what? It's not just about the afterlife. It's about the here and now. Right? Following this guy named Jesus. Following this this lamb who dealt with this unjustice slaughter. Who died on the cross for your sin and the things that you did wrong and the separation you caused. Leads to a right relationship with God. And a right relationship with God frees you. It does. Not only does it free you from your sin, it frees you from the constant ritual sacrificing. The constant hardships and enduring of the mental agony and pain and weight of your sin. You don't have to constantly be seeking to do good things to try and earn your salvation. To try and earn your way back to Jesus. No, Jesus endured it all. He was your sacrifice once and only, and when you follow him, you're freed of all that pain. You're free of all that sin and the, and the weight that it bears on you and how it binds you. And then he goes further and talks about the law and how this constant perpetual need to earn and, and do the right thing all the time, all the time. And it's nagging at you. It's causing you to feel shame and guilt. And it's causing you to turn back to your sin. You don't have to deal with any of that. Why? Because Jesus dealt with it for you. He died on the cross once. And he raised to newness of life once so that your sin was dealt with. Savior, or being saved from sin liberates us now and forever. He says, you get to deal with that now, but then in eternity, you get to party with Jesus. You get to experience what it's like to be back in that right relationship with God without having to deal with all the junk of the nasty, disgusting, decrepit world that we live in. You have that to look forward to. And you know what? That Ethiopian said, I'm in. He said, I'm in. And I would encourage you tonight, if this is the first time you've heard this wonderful story, be all in. Maybe you're sitting on the fence. Maybe you're saying, is this Jesus thing worth it? I can tell you it is. That relationship with God, that freedom from sin, the, the dealing with the bondage and the addiction that you're going through and wrestling through is worth it now. Yes, now and for all of eternity. Right? It's worth it. That's why we're here. Because here's the thing. Philip was a man changed by God. He didn't go and and just spout off this information. No, he was affected by it. He was passionate about it because he was living through the exact same thing. He's saying, I was stuck. I was stuck in this constant cycle of sin and sacrifice and sin and sacrifice and trying to earn it and trying to figure it out. And you know what? Jesus dealt with it. And he saved me and he's dealt with it. And now I get the chance to walk beside him and live the way that he wants me to. And he's speaking and he's talking to me and he's, he's guiding me. And you know what? He guided me to you. He guided me to you. And the same thing is true of the people in this room tonight. As you have conversation, as, as you talk with your table leaders and you talk with other people in this room who are following Christ with their whole heart, they will tell you that he has led you here. To hear about Christ, to hear about the way that he can free you, to hear about the way that he can break your addiction and, and break the bondage to sin. He has led you here, and he has led your, your table leaders and the believers in here that are pouring and speaking into your lives. He's led them to you because they are all in, and I would encourage you, be all in. Man. There's some of you in this room who are followers of Jesus. You say, Justin, you know what? I'm all in. I've been all in. I've been dealing with my sin. God's freed me from my addiction. That's awesome. What do I do? 
And I would encourage you to be Philip. Right? To be Philip. A man who was freed from his sin, who's filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're sitting in this room and you're like, man, Justin, I've been, I've been sitting at Tuesday nights or I've been at my table faithfully and God has been changing me and developing me and growing me. He's been leading me. What now? And I'm brought to a passage in Romans. It's at the very beginning of the book where Paul is talking about his authority. Right? Who he is. It's Romans 1 verse 16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. See, Philip may not have read these words, but he believed them. He wasn't ashamed to talk to an Ethiopian who was sitting on the side of the road, a complete stranger. But he was passionate. Why? Because the salvation that he received, the way that God has changed and impact his life, is power. Power. And you know what? He's not ashamed of that power. He's not ashamed of that truth, that gospel. And because he was changed, because he was saved, because he, was belie- he believed and was passionate about the truth of the gospel... Others came to know Christ. We see after this this incident with the Ethiopian eunuch, he accepts Christ and Philip baptizes him in, in some water on the side of the road. And then, you know what he does? He doesn't stop with one guy. It says later on in the chapter, he goes to all the neighboring cities on his route. And he preaches the gospel. And he talks about who this Jesus is. Right? Because here's the thing. Oftentimes in our lives, we like to look and sit and say, God has changed me enough and I'm where I'm supposed to be. And we sit down and we cross our arms and we wait. You know? We say, we say, oh, yep, I made it. I'm good. And we are content with just sitting around and showing up in Bible study and being excited about Jesus, but that's the extent of it. That's not what it's about. Tuesday night is not the end all. Recovery is not the end all. Sunday morning is not the end all. It's not where you get to sit and be comfortable and just plateau. To plant your lawn chair and wait. No. You know what is? When we go. When we share Christ. When we're passionate. When we are excited about what God's done. When we see the value of our salvation. When we see the need of others around. And we seek to help them with their need. When they sit in their frustration. And they're frustrated of the circumstances of their life. Or they don't understand why their kids are behaving this way. Or they don't understand why they're having these problems at work. Or they don't understand why they're dealing with these health problems after years of addiction and years of sin and years of fleeing from God. We don't have the passion or motivation like Philip did to say, how can I help? Hey, do you understand what's going on? Because I know this guy named Jesus who does. Who's the solution. Who is The ultimate sacrifice and can help you. Right? Man, I think about all the opportunities that I miss. And I was as I was preparing for this message, I sit and I say, man, I've missed so many opportunities to be the Philip in other people's lives. Back when I was, you know, getting my hair cut. I'd sit down and I'd be stuck with someone for 30 minutes while they cut my hair. And never once did I mention the gospel. Man, I'm sitting in lines, places. I'm talking to cashiers. Meeting lunch with coworkers. I have every opportunity to be the Philip. But I'm content with going to my Bible study. To reading my one chapter a day. And calling it there. Man, if you're really changed by the gospel, I'd encourage you to really start living like it. 
to really start being passionate. If you've been radically changed by the gospel and you're seeing the power, even as it's working in your life, as you're, freeing, as you're being freed from the, your addiction, as you're being freed from your sin and the bondage that it's weighing on you, talk about it. Tell people. Because here's the thing. This room has the ability to reach people in places that I will never be. And you look to your left and your right, and you have each have the ability to reach places where no one else will ever be. Right? To your old dealers. To the guy at the corner liquor store. To your drinking buddies. To whoever it is, your coworkers, your family members who are seeing a change in you. They can be here next to you. But you have to have the passion. You have to, you have to be so excited and, and on fire for what Jesus is doing and has done in your lives. So I'd encourage you tonight as you take stock, as you look at your own walk and relationship with Christ, I'd encourage you to say, am I all in? Am I seeking God? Do I understand it? Do I get it? And if not, I'd encourage you, I'm going to have table leaders down here in the front. They'll pray with you. Ask them. Go to them. Let them be the Philip in your life who can explain the radical life-altering power of the gospel. Because ultimately, as we follow Christ, we should be reaching those around us. Let's pray as we continue in our Lord, we love you. We are so passionate and excited for the way that you freed us from our walk in sin. Lord, I thank you that you've changed that walk in sin to a walk with you. And I pray that we would not be ashamed of that. We would be excited and passionate to talk about who you are. I pray for my friends in this room who are on the fence. Who maybe haven't said I'm all in. We're still clinging to those old things, the things of their flesh, the things of the world, the things that are causing them to be separate from you. Pray that you would help them to see the passion that I have for the gospel, the passion that other people in this room have for the gospel and the ways that it's changed and freed us from sin. And I pray that they'd be motivated to a real and right relationship with you. And then it would start tonight. Lord, we love you. We are so thankful that you died on the cross for our sins. And to help us be free of the sin that is separating us from you. We love you in your precious name.